All right, greetings Berlin. I'm DJ Radon. I'm actually the inventor of the first uh, system of notation for DJ music. And uh, I started that in 1999 uh, when I was still at New York University in, uh, in New York. And, uh, you know, it was based on calculus. Um, I think that's what I was studying at the time. Um, so it's a system of transcription for all forms of DJ music, not just uh, turntablism and, you know, hardcore scratching. It's actually a system that works for every type of DJ. So I'm going to explain the system today, and I'm going to go through a lot of other things. I'm going to go through the history of music notation in general. But uh, today's lecture is going to be actually a different type of lecture. Instead of uh, focusing on, on using the actual turntables, I'm going to focus on uh, the visual elements of what the notation is and, and the history and, and the mathematics behind it, and as well as uh, you know, physics and geometry and trigonometry and everything that links with this system. So this is going to be a fine art piece. This is going to be a, a live piece that I'm doing on canvas. And uh, using a number of colors, I'm going to be able to just stick with blues and purples and, and uh, green and black. And uh, so yeah, basically uh, uh, in 1999 I started, uh, I wrote the first book of uh, scratch notation. It was an eight-page book called The Fundamentals, and then in, uh, the, and then in 2000, the year 2000, uh, I released my second book called TTM 1.0, and then in uh, 2013, um, I released a, a dictionary of basically every scratch technique that's pretty much possible, even though, you know, there's a lot more possibilities that are out there, and that was called The Periodic Matrix of Scratches, and I have copies of those for everybody if you want to copy. Um, yeah, and so I'm going to start out with the actual system. So the, the system is based on, let me grab this microphone. Uh, the, the system is based on uh, basic, basic trigonometry. And, um, you know, so I'm going to start out really simple. And we're going to start out with the idea of what a turntable is. And a turntable is an instrument that is basically a record that is turning at a certain speed, and that record, so I'm gonna draw a record. Let's see how good of a circle I can do. All right, let me get a bit darker here. All right, not a perfect circle, but it's fine, it's all right. So, uh, the way the record works is, um, sounds are put on the record, and uh, each sound is uh, uh, etched into a record with a stylus. And a stylus is also the thing that plays it, so I'm going to write that down. So, this is called a tone arm right here, and a tone arm basically, I'm just gonna make it a little bit more visible, a little bit more clear. A tone arm basically uh, is a device that holds the stylus, and the stylus is just a, a little small tool that reads uh, the markings in the record. And I'm gonna put a little down the middle, so you can see it's the record. And let's see, let's make a square on this. Alright, so the record, uh, you can see, uh, generally records are, are always turning this direction, which is clockwise. So as the record is spinning clockwise, there's a small stylus in the record um, that basically uh, reads information. So the record's turning and turning, and it reads information. And the way that the information is logged on the record actually goes in a spiral. So the sounds basically go like this, all around the record, and then they end at the very center of the record. Usually there's a little bit of piece of tape in the middle, but yeah. So um, um, the way that it actually gets etched onto a record is also the same way that it plays off of a record also. It's basically the sounds are um, connected to a device that uh, records the sound and then it records it onto the record the same way it actually etches it on like a, a clear piece of vinyl um, 
vinyl is made out of plastic usually, but now we've got digital technologies that work in a whole other ways, but we're just going to start with vinyl. So the way that I developed the system uh, is basically off of uh, using uh, ge geometry. And geometry is using shapes, so circles, squares, triangles, rectangles, things like that. That's basic geometry. So you can say that this is a circle right here. You can break the circle down into quadrants, as you can see. I'm going to get another color for that. So I'm going to use purple, royal color. So you can break, this, you can break a record down into, into quadrants. And uh, each quadrant, you can say that this right here is 90 degrees. That's 90 degrees, right? So this is 90 degrees, that's 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. This whole thing equals 360 degrees. And uh, that geometry has been a part of our culture for a really, really long time. You know, it goes as far back as we can really uh, count, you know, the, going all the way back to the Egyptians, the Sumerians, uh, they found a Sumerian tablet that is a perfect circle that had a lot of equations on it, that geometric equations. And yeah, let me see if this is showing up on paper. Yep, you can see it in the video. Um, yeah, so basically uh, breaking the, the record down into uh, four quadrants, or you can break it as, you know, down in different ways, but breaking it into four quadrants, you can see that, um, you know, you can, this thing, this whole thing can be broken down mathematically. So, let's say you have a sound, any sound on the record, uh, you know, it has, I'll, I'll write it right here, let's say, fresh, that's a common uh, sound people use to scratch. And uh, so, any sound on a record will have a, a general number of degrees. So you could say, I'm going to use a different color. Use blue. So any sound that's on a record has a certain uh, number of degrees. And you know, we're not going to specify, you know, I'm not going to get into details of things, just, you know, a, a, overview of basically, you know, the, the general concept. And um, so you can see right here, fresh has a certain number of degrees. You know, this is about 90 degrees, so this is, you know, a little bit less than 90 degrees. So remember, this whole thing is 360 degrees. So that's geometry. That's, that's basically what that is. So what I did is I, I realized that, uh, you know, that could be placed over a timeline, and I'll draw a timeline over here. So that's the timeline, and uh, you know, and you can divide, you know, time into increments. And I'm going to write the same thing over here. Use the same color. So we've got fresh right there, and uh, so. You see the, these are degrees right there. So the same thing is right here, and you can divide this up into increments into degrees. So this is basically degrees over time. So time is going this direction, degrees are going that direction. So it's basically the change in degrees over time. So as a record is spinning around, the degrees are changing. So if a record's going back and forth, then you see that the, it's going forward, and that's upward movement. Now, if somebody changes the direction of the record, it's going like that, it's going backwards. So let's say this point right here is the beginning of the sample, and this is the end of the sample. I'm gonna use another color. So this is purple, I'm gonna say the end of the sample is green. So that's the end of the sample. The end of the sample is right here. And the beginning of the, the beginning of the sample is right here. So you see that's going from purple all the way to green. 
So we start off right here, and it's purple. Then we get all the way over to here, and it's green. We've gotten to the green part. And then we're coming back, we've gotten all the way back to the purple part. So, that's, this is called a baby scratch, or, or a rug, and this was invented by uh, Grand Wizard Theodore. Put his name down. Alright, and I'll put Grand Wizard Theodore. Make it big. Okay, so that's that. So this is just what's called a baby scratch, and that's going forward and backwards, forward and backwards movement. And there's a million ways to, to manipulate those. You can, you can cut a scratch off for a period of time. Like, I can start from the middle of the sample. I can start from the blue dotted line. I can start from right here and say the sample's going there. And cut off the sample. So what, what, uh, what DJs do is they use a crossfader on a, on, a, on, a, on a mixer. So I'll draw a mixer right there. So mixers basically look kind of like this. It's the general idea. Looks like a person. Two eyes. And uh, um, this right here, there's, there's two general positions of a, of a general mixer. And one is uh, open position. I'm going to use a. Whoops. Let's see. We've got open. Oh, that was not drawn either. Try this. Try another one that's a little bit darker. I don't go with the purple. Stay with purple. Open. That's an open uh, symbol. And then. That, that, that denotes uh, when you can hear the sound, so that's open position, that means the music is playing, you can hear it. And then there's closed position, where the music... I'm going to draw, uh, if, the, if the crossfader is all the way over here, I'm going to draw another one actually, so you can see it better. So this is this is closed position. So when the fader's all the way over to the left or all the way over to the right, uh, that means the, the record is off. So that's that's closed position. So if the record's uh, you know closed right here, you don't hear anything, and then uh, you know you, you don't draw any sound, and then the sound comes back on. Alright, so, um, you know, that's, that's basically that, that's basically the way the system works. And now, um, we'll go into music history, actually, and the, the way that, you know, because this is going to be actually focused uh, more on, uh, on colonialism, actually, this lecture. So, we're going to start off with uh, music history, and the, the way that um, when people first started creating music, actually, uh, it was the, actually the Egyptians, and I'm just gonna make sure that we can see what's going on. The Egyptians uh, based their, uh, their, 
their music's notation on uh, mathematics. Now, all this stuff isn't even really taught in schools now because of um, a, a very important person that we need to talk about today, which is Alexander. Great. Now we call him Alexander the Great because you know that's what they tell us. You know, in school we call him Alexander the Great or Alexander the Conqueror. But you know, he killed a lot of people, and uh, you know, he did a lot of really bad things. So I'm going to cross out the Great part. Because what he did was really uh, messed up, actually, and it actually affected the way we learn today. Um, we, the Egyptians had, you know, systems of notation, of music notation, and they had uh, systems of all, all different types of things in, in a library called, uh, um, I forget the actual the original name, but now it's called the Library of Alexandria because he erased everything. So Ale Alexander, the conqueror, I'm just going to write conqueror, or uh, I'm just going to write, just leave it like that, I'm just going to cross out this. His name was Alexander. He, what he basically did was he erased everything. He burned the libraries and he, uh, you know, erased all the notation systems that existed. And uh, so, you know, all of us, like me being a musician, anybody that's watching this as a musician, we grew up learning only one form of music notation. And they taught us that, hey, that this is what music notation is, and this is the only thing that exists. And, you know, if you like it or love it or leave it, you know, and that's it. They never taught us about the Egyptian notations or the African notations, Tibetan notations. Everything was stored in this library and it was all born and then they, uh, you know, they renamed it the, the Library of Alexandria and he conquered all the way into, from Europe all the way to Asia and, and India and through Northern Africa and, and he erased a lot of information. So what part of this lecture is going to be doing is bringing back a lot of that information. All right. So, uh, what the Egyptians were originally doing uh, were this, basically. They were using circles to represent uh, time. So, let me draw what the Egyptians were doing. Very similar, they're they using circles as a timeline, and they're also using colors. Now, these aren't the exact colors that the Egyptians were using, but I'll just give you a general example. Well, this one's a really strong marker. I'm going to start using this one a lot more. So the Egyptians, they were using different sizes. I'm just going to go big with this. They were using size to represent volume. So the bigger, the bigger a circle was, uh, the, the louder the sound. And uh, the different colors represented different notes. And we never learned that. You know, I never learned that. I, I only found that out like a year ago. You know? And you know, that's kind of a shame that you know, all of our school systems all around the world, nobody teaches this. Nobody te you know, we, we just learned the, the classic wrestler style. And I'll get into that in a moment. But uh, yeah, so different colors, different sizes, so we get a different color. This is like a darker blue. I'll make this one small. So that was a lot smaller. And I'm going to write Egyptian next to it. And they use linear time just like we, uh, we do now with our modern uh, music notation devices. So time was basically going from left to right, though they didn't draw a line. Um, and yeah, so basically that's what their notation was about. So um, if there was a space in time 
where you don't play a sound, then they would just, you know, add a space, and then there'd be another. And then you can have a bigger one. This would be louder. So loudness basically uh, equaled uh, the size of the circle. And as we see, uh, not only Egyptians, but pretty much all African uh, forms of notation were using uh, circles. Um, they, they pretty much based uh, their notation systems on a circle. So it wasn't just Egypt. Um, you know, and that was thousands of years ago, the, the Egyptian notation. Um, the Sumerians had notation too as well. They were using their alphabets. You know, we're not going to get into alphabets in this lecture. We're just pretty much going to get into, into mathematics and things like that. And representations of mathematics and, and physics and, and uh, geometry and trigonometry and whatnot. So, um, to backtrack a little bit, uh, geometry is a study of shapes. So, you know, you can see this is a circle, this is put up in the squares. That's geometry. Trigonometry is, is uh, the understanding of, um, of, of waves. So basically, like, this is a trigonomic thing, which is like a sine wave. But once you start to cut the waves up, like DJs do when they're cutting, they're cutting waves up, that becomes calculus. And so, you know, a lot of people get scared of calculus, but calculus isn't scary if you just think about it as cutting waves up. So this is calculus right here, just cutting a wave up. So um, yeah, it's basically that. So the Egyptians, they, uh, you know, uh, used, they, they basically used uh, uh, astronomy as a guiding system, as well as other African systems, because these were the first. Um, and uh, if you look at the whole universe, if you look at the, the turntable as like a representation of the universe, you know, you can say that's a black hole in the center, and you know, gravity gets pulled towards the center. Uh, what, what the Egyptians were doing were, um, wait, let me make this one a little clear over here, because this one, This is supposed to be closed. There we go. So now that makes sense. So this is closed, that's open, and that's also closed. Those are three different states that the crossfader can be in. So this one's closed on the right side, this one's in the middle and it's open, and this one is closed on the left side. All right, so basically, yeah, back, back to what I was saying. Um, you know, I'll just correct you a little mistake there. Um, so yeah, basically, the Egyptians, they were looking at uh, if, you, if you look at the circular, um, the actual circle, you see that you know, it can represent a universe or it can also represent a, uh, an, an, astro an astrological system, so, you know, or a calendar or a clock. So you can look at this as you know, 12 o'clock. You know. Or you can look at this as you know, a zodiac. So they, you know, they had a zodiac and they were using the circles and you know, they, they, they had uh, different uh, representations of gods around their zodiacs, and which we use in our, in our modern zodiacs and our, in our modern clocks and whatnot. And so you can think of the turntable as a type of a clock too, since it's always moving. Um, so basically, you can see that uh, they were focusing on the circle. Now I'm going to move over to uh, more Central Africa, uh, or actually West Africa, like with the, the drummers and, and uh, Yoruba uh, drumming circles. They used a similar, similar pattern. So I'm gonna write Yoruba right here. A different color. Okay, so as far as the Yoruba, the Yoruba were using circles as well. And this isn't just Yoruba, this is all throughout uh, Western Africa, but I'm just focusing on that region because the Yoruba and uh, the Egyptian, there are 500 words in Yoruba and Egyptian that are the same.
So yeah, there's 500 words in Urim and Egyptian that are exactly the same. So um, a lot of the Egyptian priests after the fall of the Egyptian Empire, after Alexander, you know, brought that on, uh, a lot of people moved westward in Central Africa and, and even South Africa and Western Africa and the East. And uh, um, basically the Yoruba systems use circles as well. But the Yoruba systems were a little bit different. The, the Yoruba systems were, uh, let's say this is one, two, three, four. They're using quadrants, just like you could say this is one, two, three, and four. So this is quadrant one, two, three, and four. The Yoruba system was doing that, the same thing, but they would have a they would have a drum pattern, and the drum pattern would would uh, you know there'd be a pattern number one, and then we'll go to pattern number two, and then it'd be pattern number three, you know, and then it would go to pattern number four, and what they would and they would there would be a master drummer, and the master drummer would just play one pattern, and then the other drummers would copy the pattern, so maybe another drummer would start off, and they would do. They would start off and do pattern number two, you know, and then three, and then four, and then one, you know, because they'd be listening to them, so they'd be doing off of that. And then maybe another one might, so the circles could overlap. So that's threes right there, and another one, so three, four, and then back to one, and then two. So they were doing things like that. Which, you know, uh, I didn't learn that in school, you know, I just, uh, I learned that recently. And, uh, yeah, so basically uh, that's, that's where the Yoruba were coming from. Um, let's see. So, yeah, we're going more into the history. And uh, so th this wave-based notation is actually kind of interesting because the uh, Tibetans actually use the same thing. The, the ancient Tibetans... Uh, um, not too far ago, just a couple hundred years ago, not necessarily thousands of years ago, but a couple hundred years ago, the Tibetans, right, Tibet over here, this right here, since I didn't capitalize Tibet. This right here, like that. You can see it more. Alright. Alright, so the Tibetans, they were doing chants and they were using waves. They would write their words, like let's say a Tibetan word is na, that's a Tibetan word. And they would have a wave over the na, and it would say like it, uh, about how long they'd be, you know, doing the na, or you know, any different sound, any, any different. But we're not focusing on alphabets. But they were using waves, so they were the only person to use waves that were very, very similar to the way that TTM is using waves. But the, the waves of, of na, uh, I mean, the wave of the Tibetans is basically uh, it's just a pitch wave, a pitch inflection. So they were focusing on um, the change in pitch over time. So like the pitch uh, was going up and the pitch was going down. Then uh, all, later, the, the, the Byzantine, in the Byzantine era in Russia and Hungary and, and, Hungary and Bulgaria, really came out of Bulgaria, uh, which is really close to Tibet. They were using systems of, of waves as well, um, and, but those were called uh, well, it was, you know, it was the, the Byzantine style, so the Byzantine notation, I'm going to write that. So the Byzantine style was generally using lines, and they were using lines like that, and they had waves too, and they had um, all different types of things that they would put over whatever their characters were. So. Russians used it, Latins used it. Um, you can put any language under here. Basically like that. So, um, so it, everything came, started out as, as wave notation, but then it actually transitioned uh, those waves from the Byzantine era that were used in multiple languages, used in Greek, used in, uh, let me just write like a symbol on it, like let's say this is Russian. I 
don't want to butcher Russian too much. So that's like a Russian, that's a Russian letter right there. The, uh, you know, these uh, symbols, which were called nooms, or numi, they are used to uh, uh, specify how the person said the, the note or the, the, the letter, the, um, what they were singing. So everything came out of the monastic tradition, even with the priests in, in Egypt and uh, the priests, the Yoruba uh, priests and the Tibetan monks and, and the Byzantine Christian monks. Mo these were the only people that were writing music notation at first, whether the clergy, well, not clergy, but really the monks and, and, and the, the ascetic lifestyle. Which is also interesting too, because most DJs, like take Grand Wizard Theodore, or, you know, they kind of live a similar lifestyle of being ascetic as far as turntablism, uh, you know, because uh, with with DJs that have been really pushing the barriers as far as far as inventing new techniques, those are the ones that have been, you know, a lot of times comp competing in battles and and things like DMC or the IDA or you know or ITF, which is now the funk. Um, yeah, so basically, there's, there's a lot of different styles. So the wave style that, that originated in in, uh, in Tibet and, and also in, in Russia and in the Byzantine and, and, and Hungary um, and that region over there evolved into what we now know as notes. The waves were like this. They were more boxy, actually, like squares. A little line there. All right. So the the, the boxiness. It started out like this. So this transition to this. They start. They start out putting waves over the letters, and, and then instead of that, so let's say I put a character over here, like this is uh, oh, like, oh gosh. So it, um, I'm gonna write the O right here again. So instead of so before they'd be like like oh you know, but then they started getting more complex, but breaking it down from waves into particles, and this kind of brings us into quantum mechanics now. And quantum mechanics is a new field of research, uh, from the Western perspective, that it's the, it's the field of, of science that tells us that um, you know matter can be particles or waves. So you know we always thought that you know matter was just particles at first, but then we you know kind of merged into understanding that it can be represented as particles or waves. So that being said, uh, you know this transition from the Byzantine and Tibetan wave-based system into uh, using particles uh, happened not that long ago. It only happened, you know, in the, in the past 1,500 years. So also, uh, these kind of type of waves and accents are what we use now today as far as like, let's say, apostrophes and and you know symbols like that, apostrophes, and uh, you know what are called diacritics. And diacritics are just anything that's above a, a, a word that is basically giving it an accent. So you know, in German, you know, they have an O. I don't even know what it's called, but you know, uh, what, what's it called? We have an O with uh, the two dots. Umlaut, okay. So this this is called a, a diacritic. So that's a symbol. Oops. So that's a symbol that's over that's over the O. You know that tells you that it's you know a different a different way of saying it. So that's what all these things are, just telling you how to take a, a sound and manipulate that sound. And that's basically what music notation is: is, to, is telling you different ways of uh, manipulating sounds. So, um, so yeah. So that's. So that's the umla, I'll draw a better one right there. You know, and then another language, like in Spanish, they have a N, so this is German.
And in Spanish, I'm gonna, they have the enye, which is the N that has a, has a way over it. So that's a lot like, you know, what the Byzantine were doing, it, it, um, but that's just for one letter. Um, also, it's important to know, too, that the Mongolians had their, had their own notation. The Mongolians um, had a notation that was based uh, in a similar way. Uh, they had a notation that was specifically for um, a, a string instrument called a, a, a culture, or a kuchir, I forget. And, uh, and that notation looked a little bit like this. So let's say there's some uh, Mongolian text. So the, the text is right there. The notation looked a lot like this. And it was a kind of a wave-based accent mark too as well. So people started out with using accents and waves, but then it eventually transitioned into the waves becoming, uh, becoming squares, and then eventually the squares became what we now know today as like, you know, Western notes. Right? So, you know, that's, that's what eventually happened, is that these squares eventually became circles, that, you know, so this is what we learned, so this is like modern, the modern right there, Western. And yeah, so if you go to music school now, Unless you're, you know, in some really advanced collegiate study program that's maybe teaching you some of these things, they'll probably like teach you Byzantine and, you know, something else, but generally you're just only going to learn that. You're only going to learn uh, one different style. There's, you know, there's a whole, there's a million different styles. And, uh, and that's why uh, I, I grew up, uh, my first instrument was the, the violin when I was playing at age four. And, you know, and then I, moved on to the quarter, around junior high, and then I, then I moved into the trombone. And uh, when I was, you know, doing trombone, you know, the trombone's a slide instrument, which means the pitch isn't ever a fixed pitch. And, you know, they, and they were telling me, like, hey, you know, use these notes that are these, these static uh, symbols, and I was always just kind of like, I never liked it, you know. I learned it, but, you know, I never liked it. I always felt like a disconnection. And so I wouldn't even, most of the time, I'll just memorize the piece and I'm just like, yeah, I see the notes and, you know, but, it, you know, the, the instrument's always a sliding instrument. So, um, you know, I just kind of got separated from that. And then, I, you know, I put my, my high school jazz band uh, in the middle of high school and I, and I just started, you know, DJing. I saw the movie Juice, uh, Omar Epps and Tupac, and that, you know, that kind of inspired me to, to be a DJ. And then I started seeing the, the DJ Battle uh, DMCs, seeing those tapes, buying those VHS tapes back in the day because we didn't have YouTube or any access to everything that people do now. And yeah, I started doing that. And, uh, you know, so then, in, so, so 1999 is when I, I came up with this. So I, uh, in 1999, I wrote the, the eight page book called The Fundamentals, uh, um, which you can download for free. I'll put a link to it. Uh, with this video, and uh, you know, so that was just based on you know, you know, using waves, and I hadn't even seen any of these. I hadn't never heard, of, I never heard of the Byzantine stuff, the Tibetan notation, the Yoruba, the Egyptian, all the diacritics. You know, I had never ever heard of that. And also, it's, it's important to know Arabic uses the diacritics as well. So um, you know, I'm gonna put that over here. I'm gonna write Arabic. So all under diacritics. So yeah, so diacritics kind of looks like two ghosts right there. It's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, so most languages, you know, whether either you're going to like Southeast Asian languages, everybody's using diacritics, which are you know accents to change the way you say a letter or something like that. Um, yeah, so I never learned these things in school. So I'm like, why did I never you know learn these things in school? You know, in, in school. They taught me that, um, I remember uh, one of my teachers, she, uh, she said um, that Ethiopians and, 
the Egyptians, they weren't African. And you know, I, I'm actually wearing a shirt I got in Egypt, and you know, I was in Egypt, you know, everybody's African, and, you know, it's part of the continent of Africa. Um, but you know, there was a big movement, you know, through colonialism, which was an extension of, once again, Alexander, Alexander, um, and you know, Alexander the, the Conqueror, I'm not gonna call him the Great, and you know, in, in erasing uh, the history of non-Europeans, uh, you know, we've been raised in a Eurocentric society where um, pretty much worldwide we we're, were taught that every major invention, every major technology, anything that deals with art or science or technology was only invented by, by Europeans. But actually we've, we're finding out now that, you know, that's, of course that's not the truth and all that was erased, you know, not too long ago and still being erased, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, you know, whether, whether, whether it was Hitler that was, you know, burning books or, or whatever, you know, he was taking on the, the same principles that Alexander the Conqueror um, started. Because Alexander the Conqueror was actually the one that, you know, started the, uh, uh, appropriated the ancient Aryan symbol of the swastika. And uh, so in that, that being said, there's always been a strong movement uh, to erase and delete non-European uh, forms of music or science or, any, or anything like that from school. And so hopefully, you know, the schools in the future are gonna have to, you know, we're gonna have to go through a revolutionary change because basically what's happening is, uh, you know, with YouTube, everybody's connected together. We're discovering that, you know, things are, are, are a lot different than we were taught. We're, we're discovering that, you know, there's, there's a whole new world out there of information that was destroyed or information that's been covered up. And, you know, we're finding out a lot of cool things, especially with DNA, too, which, is, which goes into a whole, whole other thing. So, uh, since I'm talking about DNA, I'll, I'll go with, into the Yoruba world. I mean, I'm sorry, the Dogons. And the Dogons, you know, they were, they were aware that, you know, atoms, you know, you could look at this whole thing as an atom, too. The atom structure that we now know today is, looks, you know, there's, you know, there's a, a valence shell and, and, and the electrons, you know, move in a, in a certain way, you know, around, around the nucleus and things like that under the uh, Newtonian model. That's regular, you know, physics. That's the, you know, kind of fundamental physics. And then, you know, quantum mechanics tells us that uh, even though we you know there's electrons going around the, the atoms, that these electrons could be anywhere in the universe at any time. Um, I mean, ten percent of them, like ten percent of the electrons in your body, could be in Mars right now. You know, a lot of people don't know that. It's like ten percent of the electrons in your body could be, you know, down the street, down the block, at the corner store or in another universe, and then they come right back because they're not moving uh, due to, they're not moving around, they're just appearing and reappearing and disappearing. And that goes into magnetism and a lot of other concepts. But actually, you know, um, dealing with current events, um, they just discovered a new force, you know, uh, there was the weak force, the strong force, the gravitational force, and the electromagnetic force that we've learned about, but they just found a new force called the black body force, and that's a, you know, a fifth force that we're gonna have to add to physics class now, as well as uh, in between quantum mechanics and uh, regular mechanic and, and the Newtonian model, they just found uh, a new uh, place that's kind of in between that called cuprates, which are dealing in copper, and they they found that copper is kind of in this kind of in between other dimension. That that doesn't really apply. That doesn't really uh, can't be really calculated that well with quantum mechanic models or the Newtonian models and things like that. And so that that copper has things that are dealing with copper have a special uh, tendency that they're just now kind of uh, exploring and discovering. But what's also interesting thing in that too is that the uh, the Gnostic uh, and, and within witchcraft and um, those different traditions, copper has always been a, a very important uh, element, a very important metal, and we're just learning about all that stuff now. And uh, what's also interesting is that copper is what mostly our brain is made out of. I was watching the Dr. Sebi lecture, and you know he's telling us that you know that that uh, 
copper, our brains are mostly made out of copper, I mean it's water too, the interaction between the water and the copper, but you know, copper is what our brains are made out of, and copper is also what's at the center of the turntable. The center of the turntable has a magnet in it, and what a magnet is, is basically, I mean a, a motor in it. A motor works like this, a motor is basically um, a piece of magnet, so I'm going to draw a magnet right here, this is a magnet. And the magnet has a copper wire around it that's wrapped around it and a whole bunch of different little strings. So I'm just going to... go like that. So it has a, a magnet in there and it's, and it's wrapped around in coils of copper and it makes the, the motor turn when you, uh, you know, when this is connected to a wire this, you know, you plug it into the wall, and then, you know, it has the electricity. I'm going to plug it into a wall. All right. And, yeah, so basically, that, um, that, that's that stuff. So let's move into some other things. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Oh, 47 minutes. <laughs> All right, so 47 minutes. Uh, okay, so now modular synthesis. So what modular synthesis is, is that uh, is uh, really cool programs like uh, Reactor by Native Instruments, um, also uh, th there's uh, Max MSP, things like that, or just, you know, like within the rock, in the rock music tradition, you know, it's very common to use uh, patching and, and using a lot of, like using 10 effects pedals and linking those effects pedals together. And that's kind of similar to the, to the Yoruba tradition of overlapping these concentric circles and uh, overlapping patterns uh, to affect the other patterns in different ways. Because maybe, you know, you have this one master drummer is, a, is the master sound and it is going, you know, into a bypass and being affected and, and you know, doing, doing different things in different ways. And that's kind of how, you know, modular synthesis, you know, relates to all of this. And, uh, you know, we were also taught that, you know, the Egyptians didn't have electricity, that, you know, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, and, uh, you know, ben Benjamin Franklin, um, who would have been Benjamin Franklin, knew, like, he, you know, discovered electricity by flying a kite with a key attached to it. That's what I learned when I was a little kid, that he discovered electricity with a, you know, a light, and with a kite with a key attached to it. You know, meanwhile, we've got giant pyramids that there's no way that um, you know the Egyptian pyramids were burning lamps on the inside of it because there's no you know there's no traces of smoke or traces of uh, you know things that would show that uh, you, they were burning something on the inside and there's also big you know like the, the Dendra light bulb there's giant light bulbs that are in Egypt that you can see that there are you know they were holding light bulbs in pictures you know and it's not that hard to take, to make a light bulb. They found a, uh, um, you know, there's the Baghdad uh, battery, and they found an ancient battery, and all you need is just two elements. You just need, a, uh, you know, an alkaline and an acid, and you put those together, you make a battery. You can make a battery out of, uh, out of uh, orange. You can make a battery out of a lime. You can make a battery out of a lot of things. So, you know, uh, people could make uh, batteries out of fruit, out of all different types of, of substances. So that being said, we're, we're going to move into colonialism in general as it relates to genres. All right. So I'm going to draw a little list right here. I'm use this color because it's the strongest. What is that light blue? Here we go. All right. So I'm going to use this light blue, and uh, I'm going to do a genre thing. Here we go. So, um, have you, I, I've always thought of this, like, you know, why is it that, you know, you say you have somebody like an artist like Leah, rest in peace, who's, you know, making music, who, you know, was working with Timberland and making, like, really uh, electronic music that's really out there, really new styles, using acid, uh, acid as in, like, a 303, you know, acid, um, th that type of style. You know, on, on uh, that one song of hers, uh, I think maybe that was "We Need a Resolution." They're using acid in that. 
using a 303 and using, um, you know, Timberland was one of the first to use a lot of techno drum kits in the down tempo. But meanwhile, they'll call, um, you know, they'll call Aaliyah R&B. They'll be like, hey, that's, she's an R&B artist. Okay, and then they'll say, oh, well, you know, Marvin Gaye, who is using, uh, you know, black drums and, you know, uh, totally different sounds, guitars and basses and things like that, that Timberland is totally not even using, and Aaliyah wasn't using, they'll call that R&B as well. And um, that, that's, that brings us to the topic of, of genreism and genre segregation. And, and what that is, is that um, back, back into colonialism and bringing it back into Alexander the Conqueror, they, they realized that if you can divide a people, you can conquer them. So a lot of times, um, most genres that, are, you know, that came about in our society are, aren't actually based on the actual style of music. Most of the time, the genres are actually based on on uh, political things, on racial things. So um, a lot of people don't know when uh, jazz music first came out, they started calling it jungle music. Now we call jungle music, you know, sped up uh, breaks and and things that are residing like a, in a BPM between like 150 beats per minute and like 185, 190 beats per minute, and and it's like fast breaks or or upbeat you know, uh, drums, and we call that jungle. But back in the day, uh, you know, they, when swing music first came out, the press, the, the racist press at the time was like, this is jungle music, you know, the jungle bunnies, they're making jungle music, and, that, and they were calling that jungle at the time. So, they, so genre, um, you know, isn't necessarily just about an artist, a group of people coming together and, and calling uh, their music a certain movement. A lot of the times, genre is used to segregate and keep, uh, maintain the status quo and maintain uh, European superiority, like back to Alexander the Great. So back to Aaliyah and Timberland, you know, we know Aaliyah and, Timber Aaliyah and Timberland are making totally, you know, revolutionary crazy music, but they still call it R&B. Then, you know, five years later, somebody comes out with something else that sounds totally different, they call it R&B. So they're basically, so, they're basically, I'm going to write Euro here, I'm going to write African here, and so within the Euro, so within the African world you get R&B, and I'll put uh, rap, and I'll put reggae, it's funny, they all start with R's. And jazz. So basically, uh, what genre segregation means is that whatever you do, if you're a, if you're an African artist, or not the world, whatever you do um, as a, as an African artist, almost they're almost always gonna they're gonna call you one of these one two three four five categories. Meanwhile, if you're if you're not if you're European. And you're doing the same things, though you can get a million different categories, you know. But, um, you know, um, so because because if let's say per se, Aaliyah was, you know, of European descent, and she was making the same music, and and Timberland was making the same exact sounds. If uh, the the press is usually who labels the music, you know, uh, magazine writers, and most of those writers are coming out of out of England too, and you know, there's a strong you know connection with you know, the Latin Empire and, and the English, going back to Alexander the, um, the Conqueror once again. And uh, so, you know, let's say it's somebody's a, a, an artist of, let's say they're coming from Nebraska and, and they make a song that sounds just like Malia, then they're not gonna call it R&B. You know, they're actually gonna call it, they'll be like, hey, this is dubstep. Because, you know, if you look at the, you know, programming of dubstep and things like that, you know, it's the same thing as, you know, the, the crunk music, the Dirty South, and the, the, the trap music and everything that's, you know, really popular right now. Um, so, yeah, so basically, let's say you take another genre, like, let's say you take IDM. And that was a, a word made by the press, like, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, the late 90s. They made it up in the late 90s to describe, like, Aphex Twin and Bjork and 
and, and all like make, making electronic music that has beats that are kind of always changing and, and a more of an organic feel to it. But they would never include African people in that genre. So if an African person did make music like that, they'd be like, "You're broken beat." So, so if you're if you're Euro, you're IDM. But if you're not, if you're African, you're broken beat. So I'm gonna write broken, and that kind of has a derogatory sense. Like, hey, the beat's broken. So in IDM stands for intelligent dance music. So it's kind of like, hey, well these producers, you know, like Apex is one of my favorite producers. I mean, and he's probably influenced, you know, me a lot. Same Square Pusher, the whole Warp sound. Uh, you know, they've had a really strong impact on the world. And and those producers, what they were doing were they were, you know, basically making beats that um, that that were a lot more organic than general techno. General techno, which was going by certain sequences and and patterns that uh, were just repeating and looping, but they were making you know sounds that weren't repeating and looping, putting a lot of reverb on stuff, or you know making things uh, a lot more textured, and they were calling that intelligent dance music. But you know when African people do the same thing, they, they would say, "Oh, that's intelligent dance music. That's uh, you know broken beat music." And uh, if you go to uh, um, if you look up the works of Francis uh, Cress Welsing. Uh, she actually uh, wrote a document called the ISIS Papers, and in that she said that the main fear that came from Alexander the Great and and, and the reason why people want segregation is because of a uh, of fear of genetic annihilation, the fear of you know let's say if everybody came together, you know the you know the, uh, different countries might start looking more like Brazil or the U.S., where you know people are, you have mixed people of you know a lot of different uh, places and. Um, the, fe the fear of, uh, you know, basically white superiority um, ending by mixing with everybody. So genres have always been a, a, a device to uh, segregate people and to, um, you know, keep people in a certain box, keep these kids dancing in that grave and keep these people dancing over here. So that, let's say they want to shut down, if they want to shut down the thing, like, you know, we know that in uh, grime music, the uh, which is a subset of hip hop, uh, techno, you know, really fast uh, hip hop that was uh, pioneered by uh, people in, in the UK. The UK government was totally against it. They actually, there was a, a rhythm called the forward rhythm, and the forward rhythm they banned it. They said you can't play it because maybe somebody got stabbed at one club, and they totally banned it. And they said you cannot play that song. Meanwhile, you know, let's say you have like rock music, and maybe you have. Uh, I think there was a there was a concert in Russia where I forgot which metal band it was, but I don't know. A lot of people got killed at a show because you know people went crazy. I remember at a Chili Pepper show at Woodstock, I think Woodstock '99 or '98. You know, somebody got raped in the audience. They burned this place down, but they never banned anything. But with grime, with grime music, you know, one person got stabbed at a at a, at a rave, and they and the whole government was like. No, so then what happened was, right, that was around, you know, 2002, 2003, the, the government, uh, you know, we had grime, grime was reappropriated, and then they started calling it dubstep, which is kind of an interesting thing, and, and when dubstep came out, it was basically just a new name for what was already going on, so most genres um, are just kind of things that are created by the press to, uh, you know, keep the status quo going, keep because most press outlets, most media outlets, are you know seeking to uh, keep people segregated, you know. So keeping, you know, just like you know, we know that uh, you know there's a lot of, of tension uh, around the world right now, and a lot of that's based on you know whether it's ethnic cleansing or things like that. A lot of that's just based on you know people not wanting integration. Because when you have integration and people coming together, you know um, that that makes you know a lot of the people that were raised under the paradigm created by Alexander of conquering and pillaging and, and, and keep maintaining superiority of one people, you know, the idea of superiority, um, that, that is, you know, uh, cause basically different genres to be created. So what happens a lot of times, you know, if you look at dubstep, all the, all the, main, the main producers in dubstep, 
that are promoted by the press are all of European descent. And then, um, you know, they'll use like a token, like, like a bingo, who's a very, you know, talented producer. But, you know, it's like, why can't bingo be called grime? Or why isn't, you know, because grime was down tempo and up tempo as well. Um, you know, because we know that there's the baseline house movement and the baseline uh, down tempo movement. You can look at it as baseline crunk or baseline trap. Those things were happening at the same time. So, you know, Wiley, who's, you know, the father of, of a lot of grime music, he was doing up tempo stuff and he was doing down tempo stuff, you know, ranging from 120 beats per minute all the way to maybe 150 beats per minute. And, but, you know, when, when people first started saying dubstep, there was a, that was the same time that the, you know, the, the UK crown was totally against grime and, and, and fearing, you know, the integration. So, um, let's, gonna, let's backtrack a little bit to jazz. You know, jazz and swing music was doing the same thing, it was bringing people together, and, uh, you know, same as rock and roll. We know that, you know, I'm gonna put this over here, rock and roll, Rock and roll means uh, a black artist, means an African artist, they're using saxophones, da 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 da, da you know, they're using uh, guitars, and you know, Chubby Checker, uh, Little Richard, people like that, but, but then it was appropriated, we're gonna get into, so now we're getting into appropriation, because anytime you're conquering, like Alexander was conquering, you're, you're appropriating, you're either stealing, pillaging. So most, you know, if you look at today, most genres were actually created by African artists, be it rock, jazz, techno, um, dance techno, because we know craft work and, you know, uh, music concrete out of France, they, they began the, the actual, like, experimental techno, not dance techno. But as far as dance techno as we know it and raves and things like that, you know, that, that all started in Detroit. If you had, if you, you know, go to Hungary and ask them if you had a rave, like, hey, you know, do you know where techno came from? They probably think it came out of the UK or something because most of the press comes from the UK. Same with rock and roll. You know, if you ask an uh, average kid today, like, hey, you know, where does rock music come from? Oh, I forgot to put it on the side. Rock. On the right side, on the white side, on the, on the Euro side, uh, rock. If you say rock, people don't think of African artists. They think of, you know, Alice in Chains to, you know, Pink Floyd or, or whoever. So, so, and even if you take, uh, let's say, David Bowie, who at the time, he, a lot of times he was making, like, during the 70s, he was making really funky stuff. He was making funk. But they wouldn't call it funk because he was Caucasian. Because funk was another uh, category where it's like, oh, funk means, Funk means African, and notice how like a lot of the African terms are like, oh, it's funk, it's broken, it's funky, smelly, you know, it's a lot of times uh, grimy, you know, it's a lot of times it's derogatory, derogatory terms. We put grind on there. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so basically, you know, we've got rock and rock and roll, we know that was appropriated. If you look at uh, groups like, you know, the Osmonds and the, you know, versus, you know, the Jackson 5 came out first, and then, then uh, you know, the, the, the racist uh, people that were controlling the media and uh, the entertainment, entertainment industry at the time said, well, hey, we don't want everybody integrating and going to the same parties and having babies together, so let's, you know, create the Osmonds. Let's create something so that, um, back to Francis Quest Welsing's uh, ISIS papers, you know, the fear of people mixing together and having babies causes people to want to, you know, divide people and separate them from each other. So. That's why you know these these genres are created these new, um, to to separate them. So it's like, why can't rock and roll just still be called rock and roll? But it's like, no, rock and roll is something different. That's from the 1950s, and it's African Americans, and you know it's a different sound. Whereas, you know, rock is only Caucasian. Or so then, if you let's say you take another thing like new wave, uh, new wave music, um, you know, from the early 80s, you know, you got groups like Depeche Mode and you know amazing groups. Like that, um, if that group is African American and did the same sound as like a Depeche Mode or, or, or whatever, they'd be called R&B again. So a lot of times with African artists, we, there's a, these big giant categories, you know, that that range 50 years. But with Caucasian artists, it's never a big giant category that uh, you know goes 50 years. You know, so it's like R&B. They've still been saying R&B for like 50 years, and the, 
the sound, you know, the, the sounds in RB have nothing to do with each other, except the only thing that's the similarity is the, the race of the people that are making it. So then you can, you can infer from that that if the only similarity is a race, then it's not actually based on the structure of the music, it's actually just based on, you know, the people's race. So like we'll move to another genre, um, like let's say, uh, <clears throat> you know, like even like Kuduru started coming out. People saying, oh, Kuduru, you know, it's like African techno rhythms. But then it's like, oh, okay, well, let's make, you know, UK funky, or now they just created EDM. And I'll put like EDM over here, which is, it means electronic dance music, which, you know, Wine Atkins and Derek, you know, maybe whatever, all those guys, like all the Detroit guys, you know, they were making electronic dance music. And, Almost all techno is electronic dance music, so that genre, the name of the genre doesn't even really mean anything. It's like, what is, like, what is electronic dance music? And so basically electronic dance music just means modern Caucasian electronic producers that wanted to separate themselves from, you know, the, the dubstep movement, you know, because now they're like, oh, dubstep's dead, you know. Um, and at the time when Grime first came out, the, you know, the press was like, Grime is dead, Grime is dead, but, you know, it was... It's still, it's still really big and it's still really part of, you know, UK culture. But if the government is against it, like, we know that BBC is not, uh, is a state-owned thing. It's, it's run by the government and it's run by the Queen of England, who had, obviously has a, a colonialist agenda. So, the, you know, um, you notice that they segregate all of the music on BBC into, um, all the, the minority music into one extra, which is a great channel. But it's like, hey, why is it segregated? Why can't, you know, why can't it be, you know, in other places or on the front page, you know, of BBC? Because everybody's going to one extra, you know, and, you know, it's a really good channel. But it's, you know, it's kind of like, hey, we're going to, you know, lump all those genres. So now, um, we know that uh, Africans invented most genres of, in the, as far as the 20th century, most of the genres were invented by African producers. But if you look at who's making the money, if you look at all the top 25, uh, richest uh, DJs in the world, uh, all those DJs, they're almost all males, which, and they're almost all, um, you know, Caucasian, or of Aryan descent, like, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, it's like Tiesto is number one, and, you know, uh, you know, uh, all, all those people, uh, they're, they're making millions and millions of dollars, Meanwhile, you know, the, the people that are producing all this stuff, you know, a lot of times they, they go uh, into obscurity. Sometimes they make money. So now I'll, I'll bring up Anthony Braxton. Anthony Braxton was a, uh, uh, or is, you know, he's a great, you know, he won the MacArthur Grant. He's a, um, an amazing philosopher, composer, uh, a, a jazz player. Um, and, you know, he wrote amazing pieces, but he also came up with a theory uh, breaking music down into into three different types, and one it starts out as the reformists, <laughs> made a weird e re look at that I'm getting tired of seeing. Make it clear. So the reformists. The reformists are the people that create stuff. The reformists usually don't get paid. The reformists are, are making ideas that are so like unpalatable usually to the uh, the, the masses that that uh, um, you know that that let's see the reformists the is right there. Then the stylist, and then the classicist. So most music has a uh, um, has a curve to it. So the reformers start out making a, a, a type of music, a new style. And then the stylists usually come in and, uh, and build off of that and capitalize off of it. And then the classical people come in and just 
repeat it forever. And then, you know, and then people, you know, then things branch out to new genres. Uh, you know, so usually these people, they don't get paid. Sometimes, you know, over around this part, this, this is a spectrum. And the end of the spectrum right here. Um, you know, these people, you know, these people that are totally reformists, that totally make new, new ideas, they, they usually never get paid. But then, you know, people, some of the bigger, bigger reformists can, can make a lot of money, like, you know, you know, Apex Twin is obviously, you know, a reformist, and he's, you know, he gets paid, you know, like, I played a festival with him, you know, I think I got like 500 euros, but he got like, you know, 30,000 euros for a DJ set, and, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's a reformist. And, but he's, you know, he's getting paid, so, you know, um, sometimes reformists can get paid, but usually African reformists definitely don't get paid. Uh, you know, usually a lot of times uh, within the industry, uh, African reformists usually only get paid when they're old, when it's like, okay, yeah, we knew you did all these things that were amazing when you were young, and then people start to give their app them accolades when they're a lot older, so, you know, that goes for a lot of the, the original Detroit techno uh, producers who created most of the genres that people are still doing today and just making up new names, even though it's still the same genres. Like, you know, within hip hop, uh, you know, you've got a million different sounds in hip hop, and we still all call it hip hop. Meanwhile, you know, within the electronic world, you know, there's uh, a million genres for the same thing. It's like, how many different types of house or techno, you know, you know can you call it? And a lot of times, with, People are doing is saying like, oh well, you know, this is uh, you know that Chicago house, that's minimal techno, that's you know uh, deep house, that's tribal house. But uh, the thing is, is that you know usually what happens is that you know all those it's kind of a uh, um, all those all, all those uh, uh, lines and uh, um, uh, genres that are being created are used just to make more money and used to keep uh, you know one group of people in power. So back to this Euro side, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put all these different things. I'm gonna put minimal techno. I'm gonna put minimal, you know, there can be a million things. I'm just, I'm just gonna put just rave in general. There's a million, there's a million different genres, you know. Um, like let's say you let's say you take uh, the idea of uh, of trip hop. You know, it's like the and they made a guy do trip hop, and then that, that you know. But meanwhile, the people that were doing hip hop were doing the same exact sounds as trip hop. It's just that you know, some English writers wanted more English uh, bands to be big, and instead of wanting to include them within the, the hip hop nomer, they you know wanted to create a genre. But back to what I was saying about um, uh, colonialism and genres and appropriation, I'm going to draw a circle for each genre. Like, let's say you have all these different genres, these are all different genres, these circles are different genre. And then let's say you have these like, so let's say you say, okay, these are the African genres, and then th these are all the genres that, uh, that, that Europeans get. So like, let's say you're having a rave and you got a different room and you know, each of these could be a different room, be a different section in the record store. So let's say, you know, you're, you're um, you know, submitting your, your press kit, you know, all the young artists out there, you're submitting your press, your press kit, your, your resume, um, you know, or your new albums out. If you are being pigeonholed into only one of these genres, then you're and you're competing with a lot of other people. Then uh, there's only so many spaces for you to fit in. Whereas if you have, if you're, you know, of European descent, you have the, the freedom to have a million genres. You know, they'll they'll put you in a million different genres. You know, it's like, hey, you, um, you know, it's like let's say you take a group like Hot Chip. It's like those are uh, you know talented Caucasian males that are you know singing over over techno. Um, in a way that like Aaliyah is kind of singing, but they don't call it R&B. They don't say like, oh, he's a new R&B group, you know. Um, they'll say like, hey, this is a, you know, some new type of, uh, you know, post-minimal industrial rock, da da da, and they'll call it, you know, something else, you know. And then so they so they make it so Hot Chip gets money from this category, and then it's like, oh, this these guys they get money from that category, and Boys Noise they get money from this category. Meanwhile, it's like, oh. 
There's only one techno, there's only one black techno position. It's like, oh, okay, one, one Atkins is getting his money from that, but then all the other producers, they can't, they can't get into this category. So a lot of times, you know, with, with, with if you, um, uh, African artists that are that are doing like really new sounds, they if they don't fit into R&B, rap, reggae, or jazz or world music, they're not getting gigs. They're not because. All, all the people that are running the festivals, you know, um, you know, most of the festivals. If you look at all the top festivals, be it Coachella, you know, be it um, all the top booking agencies like the Tom Windish agency that has a monopoly in the U.S. Almost all the artists are all males and they're all Caucasian. So that means women are are, are being discriminated against, and non-Europeans are being discriminated against, and that goes that's you know all around the world. And, and part, but you know. What they'll say is that, oh, they're not being discriminated. You know, there's big festivals, reggae festivals, and there's, you know, these hip hop festivals, you know, which is great, but, you know, there's not a lot of integration within the music world still. You know, if you go, most festivals are very, you know, segregated. So let's say you take a, like, within Europe, there's a lot of uh, Turkish population anywhere. You know, I don't see, you know, Turkish, you know, raves in the Turkish sections. You know, they have, they never have the Turkish or the Moroccan or the, you know, African sections or whatever. Usually, you know, um, you know, it's very, very segregated. So, that being said, let's move back into the classical and the, the style and reform. So, the reformists create stuff. The stylists, you um, take what the reformists do and they create kind of a style. And this is all from Anthony Braxton. I'm going to write that underneath because he's a really important figure. So, the reformists create the stuff. And the stylist, you know, so like, let's say a reformist might be somebody like, um, like within the hip hop world, um, a reformist, like a, a, a good example of reformist would be like, like said G per se, or Marley Marl, you know, it's like Marley Marl, you know, he, and said, like said G taught, um, they're the first ones sampling and chopping up beats and, and doing like that. And, you know, they're, they're getting their paper now, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're playing shows and stuff, but they're not getting a lot, a lot of paper. And you could call, you could call them reformists, because nobody was using, you know, people were um, looping tape at the time, like, you know, the 80s and stuff like that, but nobody was just, you know, using a, a sampling machine to just totally make new beats. And that was, a, you know, a totally new thing, a totally reformist type of thing. But then, let's say, you take somebody like Mad Lib, who makes a lot more money than they do, and so he was able to build on top of what they did, and you know he made a, a, a really cool style out of it. Um, you know, but you can even say that Madlib kind of came after RZA, and that RZA, you know, made you, you know usually like uh, the where the stylists and reformers come over here, they probably make the most. You know, like it's kind of like a bell curve. You know, kind of kind of actually relates with this curve right here, and the you know reformers actually, I mean the stylists. Uh, you know, let's say you put RZA right here, you know, Madlib could be right here. I'm going to write RZA. And I'm going to write Madlib. And then you go into all the people that they just listen to Madlib and then they, you know, want to be like Madlib. So then they make these and it becomes, you know, classical music. Uh, in the sense of like, they're searching for a classical, you know, 90s hip hop backpack sound that, you know, was was pioneered by, you know, by these certain people from a certain era. So all these things, the performance of styles and the classical um, sections uh, uh, of, you know, of, uh, of music birth, of new genres, that usually happens, you know, um, it can happen really fast. It can happen over the course of three years, it can happen over the course of, of ten years, depending on, depending on the genre. But the thing is, a lot of, but most genres are, you know, a lot of times are just made up. So actually, one of the things I'm working on now is making a, a, a matrix of genres that really uh, breaks down um, and finds essentially what real, the real genres are based on the actual beats and the rhythms versus press and, and, and race, you know, um, which is usually what the, what the genres are built on. But uh, let's see. Yeah, back to the appropriation, I think it's, uh, very, very interesting uh, to, to recognize this fact that, you know, um, I'm going to write techno over here. Even though we know that dance techno was, you know, an African, uh, you know, a mostly gay, uh, African-American thing from Detroit. 
you know, it's not that anymore. It was, it was taken from this side and put over to this side. So, you know, let's say we take funk right here that I wrote down. I can write disco right here. So at the time, even if two artists in the 70s were making the exact same thing, if it was a Caucasian artist, they'd be like, oh, you're disco. If it was a, you know, um, African artist, they'd be like, hey, it's funk. You know, if you're David Bowie, you're, then it's like, no, it's, it's rock. You know, it's not funk. You know, because David Bowie was, if it's not danceable, or you're Caucasian, and you're just funky, it's not just like laid back, more out there funk. It's, it's, it's still, it's rock. So that's basically what they were doing. They were just, you know, segregating those, those genres based on those things. Um, back to uh, New Wave, because I was bringing a New Wave. I kind of didn't finish that off, that New Wave right here. The New Wave, if you're African, that's, that's freestyle. Or, or if you're Latin, if you're Puerto Rican. Freestyle music was a music um, that was using, you know, electronic beats and, and uh, er, er, early mid 80s uh, music as using electronic beats and they were um, you know singing over it and uh, a lot of times you know they're cutting up the beat which kind of it's actually a precursor to early you know IDM is really the, the birth of uh, IDM and, and stuff of making beats that are, aren't repeating but they're still uh, electronic and electro and those are people uh, producers like uh, like Jelly Bean who did uh, Madonna's first album and uh, you know Jelly Bean and also uh, Mantronics Mantronics, you know, and they were cutting up beats, and uh, but the thing is, it's like what they did in the '80s was they're just saying like, oh, that's R&B, or you know, that's freestyle music, freestyle R&B, you know. But if it's a you know a Caucasian artist, and it's like, hey, that's that's new wave. Um, and uh, you know, there's an interesting th thing, uh, you know, that going back to Alexander the Great or the Conqueror, um, he actually. Uh, Brought, up, brought upon the Hellenistic era and, and, and Hellenistic. And I was just doing some research on, on, on Hellenism and Helen last night, and it's, it's, it's deep. If you actually look where, um, I'm gonna write Hel Hellenistic. Era, within the Hellenistic era, that was the spread of Alexander's conquering all around the globe, all up through, through Asia and through Europe and, and, and Northern Africa and into Northern India. Um, and, I, and actually, I didn't talk about the Indian notations too. You know, the Indians had, had, their, had their own forms. Um, you know, the, the Tamil, uh, the Southern Indians, the Dravidians were the, you know, DNA-wise, it's been proven that they are the original, you know, Indians and then you know the Aryans, the uh, Iranians, and more Europeans conquered uh, later and, and co-opted a lot of the, their systems. So all the, the, the Sanskrit and, and all that actually comes from uh, Tamil, uh, Sumerian uh, linguistics and what and whatnot. Um, but uh, you know, so started going all the way back, um, all the way back to the Aryans. In India, conquering the uh, the Dravidians and the Tamils, the, the, the natives of India, and appropriating uh, their their language, uh, which was Sanskrit, we've come all the way now to thousands, and thousands of years in the future. The same things are happening. So you know, and, and it's never stopped. That's why you know, with with the appropriation of of uh, you know non-European cultures by Europeans. Uh, culture and music and you know ma mathematics or sciences or whatever um, all that has just kept on going on over and over again so basically you know uh, you know th that's kind of why I, I kind of focused the lecture on, on this but um, point being in, in Germany as we speak because you know um, a lot of uh, the you know the history of, of where we are now you know um, you know, is a great example of that, and burning books and, and whatnot. And now it's not about burning books. Now it's about you know making blogs um, instead of destroying somebody else's information. It's more of just making a, your own marketplace where you can make a thousand different things and, and belittling somebody else's information or not hiding somebody's information. But I just found here. Uh, let me see.
Well, I, I just did an etymology, etymology search on, uh, I'll just go off, off my head, etymology search, and uh, um, the, the word hell, which, you know, actually, you know, come, you know, come with Hellenistic, and, you know, comes from Helios, the, the sun, and the light, uh, you know, the word hell in German means uh, like a form of light, but it, it actually comes from a Dutch, uh, I mean, like, there's a, a Dutch meaning of it that means to cover up. And uh, I did a, if you go to the etymologydictionary.com or just search you know, Google etymology online, um, the, the, the etymology dictionary is a really powerful dictionary because most dictionaries now only show us like, you know, a meaning that goes 100 years back or 50 years back. They're usually not showing us the meanings of words that are going, you know, 500 years back or 1,000 years back. But the etymology dictionary says, you know, that uh, th there's a Dutch word that, that Hill's linked with that it means to cover up and to hide. And also, what's interesting too is that um, with uh, the, if you look up Helen, just the word Helen in the Oxford Dictionary, um, the word Helen in the Oxford Dictionary says, um, you know, let me let me uh, open it up right now. I just took a screenshot of it. Does anybody have any questions? Let's see. There is a screenshot. Uh, yeah, so Helen right here says, of or belonging to hell, which is interesting because, and, that, and that's the English dictionary. And, we're, and I'm just going by the English dictionary. We know that English came after German, so the English took the word light and you know, twisted it into a, a bad thing. So within the English tradition, hell means, uh, you know, a place where bad things happen, but uh, it means an underworld or, or you know, a place where, but in the English Oxford Dictionary, Helen says, of or belonging to hell, that's, you know, it brings us back to Hellenism, I mean, in, in, in the Hellenistic era of spreading, you know, hell on earth is kind of what, um, and I'm not coming from a religious standpoint, I'm just talking about, like, physically actually what uh, Alexander the Conqueror actually did, you know, he was you know, burning and destroying and renaming and erasing a lot of information, and that's what their whole uh, agenda was, you know. And and uh, in that, you know, that tradition has, you know, it came, it started out of where you know Alexander came from, from Southern Europe, but it now it's culminated in in, in you know in Britain and in the, in the British Empire and the British Empire's you know subsidiary, which is you know the, the United States. My country, and you know, and, and it's it's continued on and into um, into all walks of life. But what's actually also interesting too is that uh, when swing music was happening, um, let me uh, stop the camera just one second, just in case. 